Good morning, everyone. My name is Cecilia Aragon, Cecilia Aragon, and I'm very happy to be here. I, it was a pleasure to meet many of you yesterday, and I'd like to especially thank the Fulbright Commission staff who've gone really be above and beyond in their help to make give us a very warm welcome here on our first day. So thank you very much. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about visual analytics of social media data. And um, so whenever I talk to an interdisciplinary audience like this, I like to give something of my background so you know my biases and, and where, my, where I come from. So um, I'm, I've been a, a, a professor at the University of Washington since 2010, and I have multiple um, affiliations, so I won't list them all here. But my background is in computer science. I got my um, PhD in computer science from the University of California, Berkeley, and before that I got my bachelor's in mathematics from the California Institute of Technology. And I'm now a professor in the College of Engineering at the University of Washington. But before I came to academia, I had a very non-traditional academic life. I spent 15 years working as a data scientist and software developer. And I worked in industry at many companies, both large and small. I worked at NASA, and I worked at a national government lab in Berkeley. I also spent three years as the founder and CEO of a, a small startup. So my lab at the University of Washington is called the Human Centered Data Science Lab. How many people here know, have heard of the term data science? Raise your hand. Yesterday. Oh, just yesterday, okay. <laughs> so um, essentially what um, data scientists do is make sense out of very large data sets that we are being overwhelmed with data these days. And um, uh, it's typically done either with statistical models or via computation. When I talk about human-centered, what I like to say is the, uh, it's very important to also consider the human component in this. Just having wonderful mathematics and very efficient algorithms is not enough. You have to go that final distance to, to make sense, for humans to be able to make sense out of the data. And um, in our lab, we use what we call visual analytics. Visual analytics is the combination of visualization um, and, uh, and um, computational algorithms that can be used over very large data sets. In particular, our current focus is text communication, what we call informal text communication, like texts, chat, Twitter, Facebook, those type of social media posts that are not edited. So for example, emails or, um, or um, reviews are, are formally edited and so we don't, we don't deal with those, other people do. And video, for example, is we don't deal with that, all right? Um, so visual analytics is formally defined as the science of analytical reasoning supported by interactive visual interfaces. So this is very important because uh, the visual channel is the highest bandwidth channel into the human brain. And the power of computers now can give us interactivity. So you can see a million data points all at once and then you can zoom in on some. You can, you can shift to others. You can look at more details. You can get different views. So the combination of interactivity and visualization is extremely powerful. And so the process that we do actually has three components. There's the visual component, and then we also pay attention to human-computer interaction. So we portray this information in a way that makes sense to people. And finally, we do a lot of sophisticated mathematics and, and uh, computational modeling in the background because there are some things that computers do better than humans. There are also things that humans do better than computers, so you want to take both of them and meld them in the best way possible. And that's what our lab is all about. So this is a really an iterative human-in-the-loop process. So we link visualization and computation, and we're constantly going through and refining. It's not like we produce a model or an algorithm and then say we're done. We produce one, we test it with people, we, we, we iterate and we improve it and we do this multiple times. And this is a very effective method 
for understanding very large and complex data sets. So some people ask me, well, why do you focus on text? I mean, aren't we in the world of videos and images now? And it's true that videos and images are a lot more, in many ways, they're more appealing. But the fact is that text is not going away. As a matter of fact, we are using more and more text. Even as video and images um, are appearing, we are generating more and more text, ex and it's a expon tremendous exponential growth. As a matter of fact, every single day today, we generate more text than we produced in human history up until 2013. And it's getting bigger all the time. All right, so text is not going away. It deserves to be studied. Um, so this is just some of the text data that there is. As I said, we concentrate really more on the, the, the more informal parts here, all right? Although there's all these other types of text too that many of our techniques can also be applied to. All right, so, okay, um, what can we learn from social media text data? Well, it turns out there's quite a bit. So for each of these five bullet points, I have a story. I'm not going to tell each of these stories because this is a short talk. But we can learn a great deal about human behavior. So sociologists can study this data to understand what's going on. We can learn about societal trends. There's even been some work predicting the stock market with mixed results. But we can certainly analyze past trends of the stock market via social media, believe it or not. Um, we can learn a lot about infectious diseases. Who here has heard, heard about Google flu trends? Yeah, yeah okay, that. so that's right. So that is both a success and a failure, all right? And we can learn a lot from that, but I won't talk about it today again. If, if people are interested, you can ask me later. I'm happy to tell the story. What I want to talk about briefly, though, are earthquakes, since we're here in Chile. And um, so everybody here is very familiar with earthquakes, but maybe in the United States we're not as familiar. So this is the story I'll tell, based on some work done on Twitter by Chileans. Um, so after an earthquake has occurred, it's very important to have sensor, sensors buried in the ground to measure where um, that it was strongest, so you can find out where the epicenter is, so you can learn, you know, what is going on in terms of the fault lines. And there are many sensors, and this is the way it's traditionally done, that these sensors tend to be very accurate, but obviously you can't have all that many, all right? So the number of sensors is limited. So uh, the idea that some of our Chilean colleagues had is, well, why don't we use Twitter? Because what happens after an earthquake? Everybody starts talking, oh, did you feel the earthquake? Yes, I felt it. Uh, um, and, uh, and it turns out that by analyzing this, and you have to analyze it carefully, all right? You can't just do it with a very, you know, with a, with a very um, naive um, machine learning algorithm. Because if you just say, I felt the earth move, well, it turns out people say that for, at other times. <laughs> Um, other than just, you know, when there's an earthquake. Like, can um, you give examples? I'm not going to give examples <laughs> because we're live streaming, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, the, the fact is that you need to, the point I'm making is you really need a human-centered approach to understand this. You can't just run a Python script over a billion tweets and get a good answer. Um, anyway, by looking at this data carefully, it turns out that because there are so many people, so you have so many sensors, they're obviously not as accurate as, as the physical ones buried in the ground, but it turns out you can get just as accurate a picture because you have so many people tweeting about the earthquakes. So they were able to, to show the, via their modeling that they could detect the epicenter just by looking at Twitter data. Okay, pretty interesting, I think. Um, so, okay. So what do we do in our lab? Well, existing research, there's plenty of research on social media text data, and it actually ranges along a quantitative to a qualitative spectrum. The quantitative research is something that, that we computer scientists and mathematicians tend to do. Um, and the qualitative data is what's been done by sociologists and other social scientists, people who do textual analysis, and there's, there's been a lot of deep work for, for decades, really, probably a century, on how to analyze text, whether it's written or oral. And um, 
So from my background, the advantage of quantitative or computational approaches is that you can process large amounts of data very efficiently. But the bad is that it's relatively shallow and superficial, and there tend to be a lot of errors, all right, as I, des as I described earlier. That happens a lot. Language can be misused. We still don't have automated machine translation, for example, and we won't for probably a long time. Now, anybody who's used Google Translate knows that it's, it's not really very good. And there was actually an excellent article by um, uh, Douglas Hofstadter on the flaws in machine translation in the current state of the art, all right? It's very useful as, you know, as it goes, but it's, very, it's limited. Anyway, so it's shallow, all right? It's helpful, but it's shallow. Now, for qualitative analysis, um, what you can get from sociology and anthropology, you can get deep explanatory conclusions based on this text. But the bad, of course, is that people, you know, are slow, right? We're not as fast as computers. It takes a long time. And so it's not very, it's not very efficient, and you can't analyze. One person can't read a billion tweets. It's just impossible. So, how do we get the best of both worlds? This is what my lab is trying to do. And so we study how to combine the computational techniques with qualitative analysis. So um, we've been working on this. Um, this is one of our early papers from 2013 where we started looking at this project. So we've been doing it now for about five years. Our goal is to integrate Techni computational techniques like machine learning and interactive visualization in a qualitative research workflow. And without going into a lot of detail, we find that we can draw conclusions based on large data sets while maintaining context, nuance, and depth. Um, and as just one, you know, there are many findings we've had, but w one key one is that um, when people develop machine learning algorithms, they often look only for the most efficient uh, the most efficient tool. And we have found that it's important to select these computational tools based on human understandability and that you actually get better results if you do that. Even if it's not the most efficient algorithm, um, it turns out there are many machine learning algorithms where you, the, the parameters can be more transparent and you can get better results when you have humans in the loop doing this. And uh, this is, others have confirmed this as well. And this is a growing field, is, is studying machine learning algorithms that are transparent and understandable and interpretable. So um, this is just a summary of some of the work that we have done in our lab. Um, we do both quantitative and qualitative methods. So um, in my department, human-centered design and engineering, we're actually a wonderful interdisciplinary department because we combine both computer science and engineering techniques with social scientists and anthropologists. And we work together to do work that's, that involves both the quantitative and the qualitative. And um, so, so my students, for example, are a combination of, of people who know how to do software and mathematics and people who come from, a, say, a background in anthropology and who know how to do ethnography very well. Um, so we pr both produce theories on trying to understand how people deal with very large text data online, and we produce open source software that, that is freely downloadable that anybody can use. So we've developed multiple visual analytics tools and actually online games as well that people can use to understand data science. So I'm coming to the end of my talk, so um, I, I want to give a very brief description of some of my past work where I looked at text communication among astronomers. So I did a lot of work in visual analytics of astronomy data. As a matter of fact, that was, my, that was work I, I did previously, um, looking at how people automating supernova searches, and I had some very good results with that in the past. But a lot, as I was doing that, I also looked at cross-cultural communication. And one of the things that's very interesting is that it turns out that astronomers operating a telescope kind of have some of the same problems that pilots in a, you know, the, it, a lot of it has to do with collaboration, how crew coordination, how you understand this. And the astronomers were actually operating a, te a large, complicated telescope um, um, remotely. 
and they were communicating via text because that was cheaper than actually video conferencing, which was too expensive for them. Um, and it turned out that there were some errors in cross-cultural communication that we were able to solve by building a chatbot. All right, and do I have time? How much time do I have now? Can I? It's about three more minutes. Okay, three more minutes. Oh, for so, seven. Okay, well, all right. I will explain it very briefly. Essentially, the um, because it's an interesting story. So essentially, the uh, there was a problem because there were um, the astronomers were in different parts of the world, and um, and due to time zone considerations, they had to divide up the tasks in a way that made sense based on when people were awake when the telescope was work operating in Hawaii at night. And because of this, it turned out the more the junior scientists were operating the telescope. And there was, when they started, there was a problem because the, um, the data was not, the, the senior scientists would wake up and they would find data had not been collected. And so they would say, well, what was wrong with these junior scientists in this other country? And um, and it turned out that, and, and they would try all sorts of things. They said, look, call me if you have a problem. The senior scientist said, I'm going to put my phone by the side of my bed and call me if you can't, if, if, if you can't get the data. It wasn't happening, right? And so what we did is we created a chat bot. So all you had to do is type SOS in the chat and the name of the senior scientist. And then that would send a text message to his phone. It would wake him up. He would get in the chat, and he could solve the problems. And it turned out that that the affordance of the text message, uh, the it turned out those junior scientists were very nervous about waking up a senior scientist from his sleep. And by sending a text, though, they they didn't mind sending a text. They were younger. They were more comfortable with dealing with text. And so they would do it. So they. They would type SOS, the name of the senior scientist. He would wake up. He would come in. He would solve the problem. And the amount of data collected went up by a factor of four just by writing this very simple chatbot. OK, so this is another example of the power of text to solve social problems as well. All right, so um, that's my talk for today. Um, again, thank you very much. And any questions? Yes? Um, uh, great, great talk. And Really interesting. I'm fascinated by data science. And yes. Data. Um, my name is Dave Fogelson. By the way, I met some of you yesterday. I'm the Embassy Cultural Attaché. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Um, so we are really one of the things that we've had a tough time here in Chile with is determining English proficiency. There's there seems to be some data out there, but um, it, it's a bit tough to get at it, um, as well as you know try to make sure the right kind is collected or how we might be able to determine what proficiency rates are so that we could um, increase English proficiency, which is one of our top priorities. So I guess this isn't so much as a question as, as kind of a thought um, in, yes. in terms of if there's a, a way that you could, while you're, while you're here, maybe help with that endeavor. And I know the education ministry is really interested in that. So OK, so I even I, so I've done a lot of work in cross-cultural and bilingual communication. And that's one of the reasons I'm here, is I want to study Spanish you know, informal text communication as well as English. There's a lot of very interesting differences in bilingual communication that I'm not going to go into right now. But yes, I think one idea might be, I think that you might be able to do some measurements just by looking at tweets over in a community. Um, and that's something that. You know, I that I hadn't thought about it, but now I have an idea for a research project <laughs> that um, that we could measure because again, you have so much large data, and we have access to all the tweets. That's the advantage. It's not always the best signal. It's very noisy, but it's there. It's you know free of cost, free of charge, and I think that based on my experience looking at how people tweet, I think we could probably talk about some of this as well. So we should probably talk offline, but I, I think it would be an interesting research project. All right. Any other questions? So yeah, so what I am trying to do is, so all this work here, I didn't mention specifically the project I'm doing, but essentially we, I'm collaborating with, with a professor at um, the Uni Universidad Santa Maria who studies how people use um, social media to um, 
you know, communicate in, with non-governmental uh, organizations and, um, and in the government and how government data is shared. And so one of the things we hope to do is look at a, a corpus of text both in Spanish and in English and to do some analyses and some comparisons. And I'm very excited about, about expanding my work into, into Spanish as well. So that's what's, what I'll be doing here. I do, oh, sorry. Well, yeah, please. I do have one question. Yes. So the, the open source tools that you've been developing yes. and the games, where could, it, where could the interested parties find these? Yes, so they're all on, OK. Well, if you let me go back. Um, so if you go to this website, OK, HDS. you can also HDS, Human Centered Data Science Lab, or you can just Google, human, if you Google Human Centered Data Science Lab, we're the first hit. We're going to find you guys. Okay. Yeah. We kind of, I kind of coined the term. So human centered data science, which other people are using. I have a Google alert on it now, and I notice other people are using it. So, so it's growing in importance in the data science world. Um, and all of this is up on GitHub. So you can download any of this work. We're, we're active. We, we welcome feedback. We love users. So um, please use it, and we will be happy to respond to you with any questions. Great. Okay, thank you.